term Native American in and of itself um, references somebody who's native to the Americas. Um, a lot of folks ask about that terminology and what um, folks don't necessarily remember is that actually the uh, Native nations, and, and it's very important to realize we were Native nations and still are Native nations, are all across uh, the Americas, not just uh, um, all across North America. So I myself am a member of the Seneca Nation and uh, I identify as being a, a, a Seneca and part of the uh, Iroquois Confederacy. This was made up of uh, six different nations. It was a confederacy that's historically been there. Um, they call it the Iroquois Confederacy, which in, you know, in itself is French, um, but they, originally the term was Haudenosaunee, which means the uh, people of the Longhouse. Um, so I always think of myself as Seneca, not necessarily Native American, because that's my nation and that's where I'm from. And I'm a member, proud member of the Haudenosaunee. You use the term uh, longhouses. Uh, what does that mean? The longhouse uh, it was a was a structure that we uh, would reside in. I mean, that historically I've was seen it at the Iroquois house. Indian Museum. Exactly, you'll see it at um, the Iroquois Indian Museum. Um, there's a wonderful um, park out near Rochester called Gnondegan, where they have a beautiful longhouse. But the longhouse would be um, a house where uh, members of the nations would reside, um, centered on a clan. In the Senecas, we have eight clans. They're, they're separated into two sides. There are the birds and there are the animals. Um, the birds are the bear, um, let me go back through the bear, the um, wolf, the turtle, and the beaver. On the bird sides, you have the hawk, the snipe, the heron, and the deer. Um, you might ask about the deer, but that has to go back with uh, uh, fundamentally how the, the clans were set up. But you'd have uh, eight different clans, and the longhouse would reside one clan. It was uh, seen as a family, uh, almost like a family unit. And the clans themselves would not intermarry, and that was mm -hmm. historically w what occurred. That, obviously, that was um, the longhouses were. Uh, folks reside in longhouses historically. It's interesting, uh, no longer reside in longhouses. Uh, the idea for this show kind of came from uh, something which you were uh, very involved in uh, at the beginning of the year and continue to be involved in in New York State. It's the uh, two-row Wampum Treaty, which took effect in the 1600s, and right now you're celebrating your 40th, 400th anniversary with celebrations all across New York State, going from Buffalo right down to the um, United Nations in mm -hmm. New York City, and you continue to celebrate it. What is the importance of the uh, two-row uh, Wampum Treaty? Uh, it's actually very interesting, and, and I think uh, one of the things I always try to focus on, too, is just uh, people focus on the word when they, they hear the two-row Wampum. I've always really focused on the Turo wampum itself. Um, there is a treaty they talk about, but the Turo in and of itself is an idea. It's a concept that actually occurred prior to the treaty that people uh, reference. The Turo is, uh, it symbolizes really an idea uh, to, from mm -hmm. my perspective, from my understanding. Um, at the time, the wampum, and people sometimes wonder what wampum is. A wampum was a way that they developed what's called a, a, a wampum belt. It was a way to record history, a way to record um, the story of what the Turo meant. It was really a way of living life. Um, if you looked at the Turo, it, it, it is a belt made of, they call them wampum beads. They're made of quahog shells. Um, there are two colors of those shells. They're, they're white and they're purple. Um, it's a white belt and it has two rows uh, across that belt that go through there. Um, two rows of purple um, beads. And what those represent are two canoes. Those two canoes go across this belt, never uh, crossing each other's path, having mutual respect and uh, understanding for each other's cultures. Um, I originally, it, it was, a weird situation. About two years ago, I, I ran into some folks in uh, Saratoga, and they started talking about the Turo. And I realized uh, I recently had a, a gr addition of a granddaughter to my family. Congratulations! And, uh, thank you. And uh, but when they spoke of the Turo, I started realizing it was a universal message that um, 
between cultures, regardless of cultures, if it's Native American or, or uh, Seneca's or, and between other Indian uh, nations or if it's between uh, different cultures wherever in the world, there really needs to be this mutual respect and understanding and education of one another. Uh, jumping back to that belt, what these two canoes would do is they would go down this river, as I was pointing out, mm -hmm. never crossing each other. However, um, people, the river symbolizes really the environment and it symbolizes a river, because if you think of it, those two canoes need, need a river to really travel along. Um, we share that river. Uh, we have to ensure that we respect that river and that uh, when you think of it, that's really our environment. And one of the big things is, I think no matter what your culture may be, um, what your concerns may be, uh, we all have to be respectful of the environment because without the environment, none of us will be around. And so, to me, it really latched onto me, really hit me hard. And um, I got involved with a, a group in the Capital Region, actually with the neighbors of the Onondaga Nation in Syracuse. Um, it was a wonderful group, a wonderful adventure. And what we did was, uh, they called it the Turo Wampum Renewal Campaign. And, uh, we, they took canoes, actually the canoes began, canoes and kayaks, they began in Syracuse at the Onondaga Nation. Um, as you pointed out, the Iroquois Confederacy or Haudenosaunee are originally were five nations. They start from the east going to the west. We start with the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Senecas. Um, that would be five nations, and then later the Tuscaroras joined, and that became the six nations. Sometimes they'll refer, refer to the Haudenosaunee as the Iroquois or the six nations. Um, that kind of represents that. And sometimes you'll see what's called the Hiawatha Belt. You'll see it's, um, it's become more popular. You'll see this on stickers. It's actually a, a lot of times you'll see a, a purple belt. It was a wampum belt. It's purple, and it actually has four um, squares on each side. These squares are made out of white wampum beads. And then in the middle is a tree of peace. And uh, sometimes that's the keepers of the fire, they'll call it. And that's the Onondaga Nation. That, to me, is the center, the heart of the Confederacy. And so these canoes and kayaks began at that heart of the Confederacy. And they came across uh, New York State to Albany. And then at Albany, we had a kickoff at right. Sage College. Right. And uh, we had close to probably between three, um, probably two to 400 Well, you increased uh, awareness about Native Americans, their mm -hmm. contributions to New York State and the Native uh, American culture. I learned um, so much from that. And, and actually, because of uh, you know, our knowing each other, had more than a pa Kathy and I had more than a passing interest. And it was oh, just, to, I remember you going down the, the Hudson River. We talked about this and people stopping and pulling over the side of the roads to see all of the canoes sailing down to the United Nations in New York City. It was a great event. Oh, it was And wonderful. you're going to continue this, too, awareness of it, right? Absolutely. We've, uh, one of the greatest things um, was to just really be able to network. And uh, some of the uh, networking hasn't just been am among Native Americans, it's been people across the world, because I think the message of the Turo really is universal. And so we saw so many people get interested, and actually a lot of different ideas have percolated from that. So it's not really, uh, I think it's grown to really go beyond just Native American to just an overall message. Something you and I have discussed uh, many times, and recently on the phone preparing for the show, is the fact that um, you have Indian reservations all across the country, and in particular in New York State. And my perception of an Indian reservation is that it's, you, it's like a little country, and like Canada is a country, uh, the Native Americans have their Indian reservations, you're a country and you have your, your own jurisdiction. And to a degree, like you've said, that sometimes passports are issued by reservations, like you talked about that going over to England, and England would not recognize a passport that the United States did, and then when England decided to recognize a passport, then the United States didn't. Talk about the concept of an Indian reservation and what it is. Sure, the, the Indian reservations them, themselves, um, it's interesting, the Indian reservations, I always go back to, it's a, it's a reserve. And, and when you think about it, it was something that wasn't really set up by the, the nations themselves. It was set up by the federal government in, in treaties. And it's interesting that with the Seneca Nation, um, different nations, they, 
they're called, they're held in trust, but the Seneca Nation is not, and, and many of the nations in New York State are not. They're actually um, independent, they're autonomous in their relationship with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So the uh, Seneca Nation has three different reservations. They have the Cattaraugus Reservation, which is where I grew up. I What's your, grew, that's by Buffalo, right? That's by um, 30 miles south of Buffalo. Okay. Um, it's about 21,000 acres, and uh, that's about 30 miles south of Buffalo once again. There's the Allegheny Reservation that's near Salamanca, New York, and actually the city of Salamanca is part of the Allegheny Reservation. It's unique. Okay, it's that's one of the by few Buffalo cities. too, right? Uh, yes, it's right, out okay. near Buffalo. And so they're all in the southern tier south of Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And the third reservation is the Oil Springs Reservation. And so that's, it's um, going back, the Allegheny Reservation is about 30,000 acres. The Oil Springs Reservation is about one square mile. So those three reservations are where I would say a large majority of the Senecas reside. So to me, it's always seen as home. It's where my family's at. It's where my family still, a vast majority of my family are. I, I actually reside now in the capital region, right. Albany. Um, I call Albany home right now, but I also call sure. uh, Cataraugus my home. And it's a territory. And actually that term's even changed from reservation to our territory. Um, but it's... It's been interesting that the reservations really were a place that kind of the, the Senecas were placed. But what I found is it's kind of reversed. And, and I know in, in our ideas today of uh, ever-changing wor words and interpretations, people can talk about the, how the reservations may have been unfair or, or, right. or how you push people there. But in reverse, it's also driven where there's been a strong connection, a strong bond, because people live there, they grow there, and and I always say it's kind of uh, similar to a small town mentality. Everyone knows everyone else once sure. you're back in the reservation. So um, I take my children back to the reservation now, and they'll say to me, well, Dad, how do you know all these people there? And I said, well, it's because I grew up there, and you mm -hmm. know everyone, and everyone sure. helps one another. And it, that's a real beautiful part of that, and really, on the reservation itself, the Seneca Nation really is the government. It really is what oversees the, the uh, affairs of the reservation because geographically, as you pointed out, that is the territory. And that's what's interesting also. People kind of think, well, um, there's probably no organization. There's probably nothing here. There was, and traditionally, there was no form of government. But there always has been, and that's really one of the big terms. And actually, I've learned it from a, a, a fellow who just has been very inspirational to me. Uh, Warren Lyons is that we we are nations, and we have a government.